Welcome, everyone. Um, it's nice to see everyone this afternoon. Uh, I'm Glory Simmons, the director of the Thatcher Gallery. Um, thank you so much for being here and helping us kick off um, the gallery celebration of 25 years. Um, this year, we're considering themes around memory and community, and it seemed really appropriate to bring Tom here to talk more about Jesuit tradition, to really get grounded in the traditions that um, are behind the arts at USF. Um, before we begin the conversation today, I'd like to um, start with a land acknowledgement, um, really thinking about the place where we are and the, pe the original peoples of this land uh, where the gallery and the university exist. Uh, the Thatcher Gallery at the University of San Francisco sits on the unceded land of the Ramatush-speaking people of the Yelamu tribe, one of approximately 50 independent nations now referred to as Ohlone. We acknowledge the rich cultural heritage that has survived colonization and genocide and honor <coughs> Ohlone artists past, present, and future. I'd also like to thank um, the co-presenters uh, for this program. So that includes uh, USF Center for Research Artistic and Scholarly Excellence, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Art and Architecture, the Honors College, the Joan and Ralph Lane Center for Catholic Social Thought and the Ignatian Tradition, the Masters in Museum Studies program, the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, Performing Arts and Social Justice, St. Ignatius Institute, Department of Theology and Religious Studies, the University Council for Jesuit Mission, and University Ministry. And all of those people, um, all those groups have been wonderful allies for the gallery, and I think that is in part with because of all of the interactions that Tom had in the beginning with, with those um, groups. Uh, now, to quickly set the scene of 25 years at Thatcher Gallery, you're getting some pictures back here. Um, I'd like to point out that we've presented no less than 142 exhibitions and countless California artists and collections. And when I say countless, it means I don't want to try to count how many, because there's so many, especially when you think of all the student artists. Um, it really adds up. Some of the most notable include solo shows featuring Carlos Villa, Richard Kamler, Sandow Burke, and Corita Kent, historical landscape paintings and photographs by William Keith and Carlton Watkins, prints by Albrecht Durer and Henry Evans, themed shows around indigeneity, Jesuit arts, experimental photography, ecology, and feminism, political posters by Tayar Tupac Amaru, and collaborations with the Japanese American Historical Society, the Asian, American, the Asian, Muse Asian Art Museum, and the Mexican Museum, and so many more. Um, and this time we've also worked with, as I mentioned, uh, hundreds of USF faculty, student artists, student interns, and student employees. And we're really grateful to all of them um, over the years and the current ones as well. And also grateful for all the teachers who collaborate and bring classes to the gallery. That's all um, kind of we could hope for is, is people visiting. Um, we'd also like to, I'd like to recognize the current gallery staff, uh, Victoria Farlow and Nell Herbert, who have um, who has significantly helped shape the um, recent gallery um, and, and the way we approach things. And I'd also like to thank uh, Steve Ryan, if he's around, for all the technical help he's given over the years. Um, and a reminder that there will be a reception in the gallery um, after this talk. Now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome the founding director of Thatcher Gallery, Father Tom Lucas, back to USF to help us consider the history of what we do at Thatcher Gallery and in all of the arts programs at USF. Many of us know Tom, who are in the room, but there's a few who don't, so I'll introduce him formally. 
Father Tom Lucas presently serves as pastor of St. Ignatius Church in Sacramento after a distinguished career as a university professor of art and art history at USF and at Seattle University. He is the founding director of Thatcher Gallery and the founding chair of both the fine and performing arts programs at USF, or what we now refer to as Past J and X Arts. Um, he chaired uh, USF's Department of Art and Architecture for a decade and was the curator of the Seattle University Art Collection. The author of Landmarking City, Church, and Jesuit Urban Strategy, he has lectured at more than 20 universities in half a dozen countries and is a liturgical artist, designer, and restoration consultant with an international portfolio. You can find his work at USF from um, in the St. Ignatius Church, to, uh, on the door of Exarts, to um, the Lone Mountain entrance. And Father uh, Lucas curated nearly 100 of the 142 exhibitions at the gallery. The arts as we know them at USF have been shaped by his deep knowledge of Jesuit tradition, his inspired artistry and vision, and his generosity in sharing his knowledge and time. Still today, Father Lucas inspires so many of us at USF to champion the visual and performing arts as vehicles for individual creative expression and collective social change. In a recent exhibition catalog, Tom wrote, the aesthetic experience facilitated by art museums at Jesuit universities play a critically important role in Jesuit teaching, thinking, learning, and contemplation. With this, he presents the arts as a teacher of Ignatian discernment, the bringing together of ideas and thoughtful consideration of feelings in order to achieve a deeper understanding of our world. I speak for many of us when I say that we are eternally grateful for Tom's unwavering leadership in advancing the role um, that the arts can play in Jesuit higher education and individual transformation and that we hope to carry on these ideals for decades to come. With this, I'd like to turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you for the warm welcome back here. I love this place, and it's, uh, I, I spent uh, many happy years here, and it's uh, wonderful to be back in, uh, yeah, being able to talk to you folks and being here uh, to present something that's very dear to my heart. So thank you very much for the invitation. In uh, the 18th century, the German poet and playwright Wolfgang, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He was born Lutheran. He became a free-thinking Mason, a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, hardly sympathetic to Catholicism. This is how he describes his experiences of going to a Jesuit theater at the end of the 18th century. He said, the public exhibition served to convince me still more strongly of the worldly prudence of the Jesuits. They neglect nothing that is likely to produce an effect and contrive to practice it with interest and with care. If there is, uh, in this, there is not merely prudence, as we understand the term abstractly, it is associated with real pleasure in the matter at hand and fellow feeling, a taste which arises from the experience of life. In this great society, it has among its members organ builders, sculptors, gilders. So assuredly, there are those who patronize the stage with learning and taste. And just as they decorate their churches with appropriate ornaments, so too these clear-sighted men take advantage of the world's sensuous eye in an imposing theater. 
This is actually what people saw on the stage. Most of us, if you know anything about St. Ignatius, think of him as, as a dour, uh, very unapproachable mystic. But in fact, he was anything but. As a young man he, uh, of his place and time, before his conversion experience in the, in the 1520s, he was a, a Spanish gentil hombre, a hidalgo, who prided himself on his dancing skills, among other things. There's a touching story that recounts that uh, after he founded the Jesuit order, he was uh, dealing with a young man who was very depressed and very homesick so to the point that he was ill. And Ignatius apparently went down to the house infirmary and broke through this young man's melancholy by singing him a Vizcaino folk song and doing a little folk dance for him. Parenthetically, he told the lad he got one and only performance and never to ask for another. But to the end of his life, he asked that people respect the arts. He adored great music, even though he insisted that Jesuits shouldn't be bound to make it in praise of God. He freed the Jesuits from the obligation to be in one place forever, uh, to sing monastic office, as the monks do uh, several times a day, which is parenthetically a blessing for anybody who's ever sung with a bunch of Jesuits. He freed us from being bound to one work and one place to make us more available to, uh, to move around. He didn't uh, do this because he disapproved of, of sacramental ministry in the church, just the opposite, but because he wanted his people not to be encumbered by time, uh, by time taxing obligations of rehearsals that would keep them away from going to the work that needed to be done, work that is predominantly work of preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching, that's going to be an important theme that we, that we look at today. Preaching and teaching lead to inspiration, to moving the imagination beyond what is ordinary, to aspirations, aspirations towards what is good, what is beautiful, and what is true, towards, to use Ignatius' own language, the greater glory of God and the good of souls. That's the key to understanding the importance of art and performance in our tradition and of the early society of Jesus' widespread use of art in general. In the early modern mindset of Ignatius and the first generations of the Jesuits, Art never, never existed for art's sake. It wasn't about, uh, it wasn't so much about self-expression as it was seen and understood as being instrumental, as a tool, a powerful and a nuanced tool that could move forward teaching and preaching and persuasion. The purpose was to inspire. Emphatically, not about oh, the artist in his lonely garret, but rather about a communal expression of shared history and faith, and it was designed to stir up great desires, great aspirations, and even heroism. So where did this come from? This young Hidalgo who had a near-death experience. It came from a profound trust that came out of that experience and his reflection on it in the power of the imagination, a discerning trust that he learned through long reflection and through long suffering. He, his his uh, injury took him 11 months to recover from, and he never recovered fully from it. But through that period of painful reflection on his own life and the meaning of his own life up against the horizon of the gospel, what he experienced he translated into a methodology that's the foundation of the spiritual exercises that are the core of the Jesuit tradition. In those exercises, among the many different uh, moments that Ignatius suggests, he, he uh, moves into a very radically different uh, country. He invites those people praying over the life of Jesus not to do it on an abstract level, but to visually imagine and to contemplate what, uh, what one might be considering. To look to Christ, to look to his life, 
to, to see Jesus who is visible, to see with the sight of the imagination, he says, the corporeal place where the thing is found that I want to con- contemplate, whether that's the temple or a mountain where Jesus or a lady is found, wherever it is, and furnish that with one's own experiences. Much the same way that, that a composer will compose music out of what he or she has already seen or heard or experienced. Moreover, and in a very important kind of coda, he says that every day, after one has considered these mysteries of the life of Jesus, we should go back and apply our senses. Very different from a much sort of more rigid view of Christianity. He says we should apply the imaginative sense of sight to hear what there is to hear, to to hear what people say, to smell, to taste, to touch with a sense of touch, always seeking to derive some profit from this sensory experience. And if one has a late 16th century graphic novel, indeed there are 160 plates in a a series of very fine Flemish engravings that he commissioned to be sent out around the world, those images were fodder for people to reflect upon, to, to feed their imaginations. And all the better if those images go to China and are carved into Chinese block prints. They become, uh, they become a paradigm. They become an example. Ignatius made a great spiritual and intuitive leap. It's a conceptual leap, leap that was, was quite different in Catholic and, and Christian uh, theology, which oftentimes tends to separate body from soul and to see the spiritual as the only good and the, and the physical as being uh, a distraction from that. What Ignatius says is the imagination can be trusted, can be trusted by a discerning person, which is to say someone who knows how to sort out their experience against this broader horizon of good and evil, against virtue and and vice. He says that it can be trusted. Why? Because he believes firmly in the embodiment of God in Christ, in the mystery of the incarnation of Christ, that Christ becomes flesh. And so this world of the flesh, this world of vision, this world of taste and touch and smell becomes a valid locus where God's revelation can happen and from which we can be inspired. And that opens us up to the transcendent because most of us aren't capable of making that leap to the the unknowable unknown, but we go there through the experience of our senses, through imminent and sense-oriented means. And this necessarily implies the making and using of images. The arts thus become a valid tool for evangelization, for spreading the good news. Um, The various aspects of art whether they're performance, whether they're liturgy, whether they're instrumental or choral music, operatic singing, dance, ballet, theatricals, dazzling uh, special effects, they all point beyond the individual to the shared tragic comedy of human life. Uh, a tragic comedy that is already but not yet redeemed and completed by what he understands as God's intervention in history through Christ. Performance literally becomes a stage on which the meaning of that tragic comedy of life can be acted out, where it can be explored, and though and, and through which hundreds and even thousands of people in Europe and in Asia and in uh, the Americas could be exposed to the artful pedagogy that the Jesuits delivered in their classrooms. Anybody who's ever been to Europe or to Latin America, anybody who's ever walked across the campus when the the gate of hell is not opened up in front of you with the steam coming out of the lawn, knows 
That's, that's all right. It happened before, several years ago, in front of the library. Now it's just moved down to Kalmanovitz, where the dean's office is, so it's not surprising. Uh, anybody who's seen these places, St. Ignatius Church, built uh, as, as a brag at the end of the, uh, uh, in the years immediately following the, the 1906 earthquake, or the Jesu in Rome, realize that there is a link between our tradition and the architecture and the art of the Baroque period. Now, in the 19th century, uh, the German Protestant uh, historians who developed the modern discipline of art history accused the Jesuits, as it were, of inventing the Baroque. Inventing the Baroque as a way of beguiling people. Uh, high drama, high emotional content, exuberance and theatricality were put up against as a kind of a straw man, against uh, a, a, as a challenge or a counterbalance to the cool rationality of the Renaissance, the Puritan simplicity of the Reformation, and the native piety of the Gothic period. Now, over the last 50 years or so, uh, recent historiography has made a much more nuanced take on this coincidence. The Jesuits didn't invent the Baroque by any means. They just used its tools better than just about anybody else. And they used those tools with a vengeance, what we might call rhetorical vengeance. And in this late Renaissance uh, humanists that they were, they were following Cicero's definition. Cicero's definition of the goals of rhetoric. Docere dilectare movere. The reason that we engage in rhetoric, visual rhetoric or spoken rhetoric, is to teach, to delight, and to move people. A triad, a sacred triad as it were, that sums up not just the goals, but an attitude that pervades the whole of the Jesuit enterprise. Great buildings enclose space, and even at the same time that they enclose space, they disclose meaning. Beginning with the mother church in Rome, the Chiesa del Gesù that you see on the left here, and replicated in a dazzling array of splendid churches around the world, from St. Paul's in Macau to a full-scale Baroque church within the walls of the Forbidden City in Beijing, to La Compañía uh, on, the, on the central square of, of Inca Cusco, to St. Mary Magdalene in Manila, in Manila, to the Michaelskirche in uh, the major, one of the major plazas of Munich, to the Church of the Bon Jesus in, in, uh, in Goa in India, to St. Saint, uh, Saint Nicholas, in uh, one of five churches, by one Je five Jesuit churches in Prague, to St. John's in Vilnius. Across the globe, architecture was a way of stamping the real estate. Uh, and more than that, it was a way of providing places where clarity and harmony and luminosity could shine through. There's almost no dark... Uh, blue stained glass windows in Jesuit churches. They tend to be very bright and very luminous. The church itself became a kind of a sacred theater where the word was taught in liturgy and in extra liturgical moments where there were clear sight lines so everyone could participate as best as they could and where the spirit could be moved through the beauty of the experience of beauty and of visual drama. As the Baroque period matured, the Jesuits employed the best artists that they could afford, two notables being, uh, being Rubens and Bernini, to name just two. Uh, uh, Rubens, who was a member of one of the Jesuit sodalities. Bernini, who designed this, uh, the, the, uh, many things for us, but especially this marvelous oval church of San Andrea al Quirinale in, in Rome. When, when Bernini was old and, and losing it, he would go wandering around the streets of the city, and his, uh, his uh, son always knew where he could find him. He would find him standing, leaning on one of those pilasters, looking up, and he would say, 
you know, Domenico, I got one thing right looking at that building. They developed their own cadre also of in-house Jesuit artists and architects. Uh, this is the, the great-great-grandmother of USF. This is the Collegio Romano in Rome. Up until the, building, the, the rebuilding of St. Peter's, the largest facade in the city, which had been designed by a Jesuit ar uh, architect, Giuseppe Valeriani, uh, crowned with a, an observatory you can see in the lower right here, where Christopher Clavius did the mathematics for uh, the, uh, the calendar we still use and where he entertained uh, Galileo. Uh, and in this large pink section down here, you have to have a college chapel. Well, the college chapel was a problem. It came at the end of the building project, and by that time, is something we're very familiar with it at uh, USF, there was a lot of nimbyism in the air. Not in my backyard, you're going to build that thing, especially with the big dome that was going to shade out the library next door that belonged to the Dominicans. No problem, say the Jesuits. We just get rid of the dome, and we call in our best and most talented uh, artist, Andrea Pozzo, to create a false dome, a canvas 56 feet in diameter that fills the circle, see if I can get the right button here, that fills this circle and from a perspective point, this is one point uh, perspective, in the middle of the floor of the building, reads perfectly like any other big dome you'd ever see. It's a marvel of, of uh, technique. Here you see uh, one of his engravings from a whole treatise he did, a two-volume treatise on, uh, on the, the use of perspective. And that's what it looks like standing with your back to the altar. It looks like it's been squashed because it's meant to be seen only from that front view. If that's not enough, let's look at the nave. The nave, which is gigantic, a barrel vault, a fairly flat barrel vault, and the conceit here is that this is the triumph of the, of the missionary activity of the order as it goes out around the world. Uh, he blows the, the, the roof off. And if you stand in the center of the room, there's a little marble disc about this big in yellow marble. It's quite uncanny. The, the, the pillars on the side of the building flow up into these pilasters. And at the very height of heaven, right in the middle, let me see if I can get it here. There we go. Is Jesus flying up into the, the, the vision of God with a cross in his arm. And from the, uh, the side of Jesus, there's, there's Jesus, comes a beam of light. And from that beam of light, it hits St. Ignatius in the chest and refracts out in four directions to the four great pillars of the church. Pow, pow, pow. And what does it ref re refract out to? Starting up at 10 o'clock, we have Catherine, well, we have Europe, whose head unfortunately got a little trimmed here. Sorry about that. She's riding on a great gray horse. Here we have Asia, uh, who's riding on the back of a camel. Africa riding on the back of a, a crocodile. And with almost prescience, a, uh, an Amerindian woman riding on the back of a mountain lion dressed in red, white, and blue feathers. It's a wonderful effect. If that's not good enough, take a look at the tomb of St. Ignatius. Uh, uh, Andrea, Andrea Pozzo did the design for that as well. The only adjective that describes it is, is pharaonic. This is something worthy of the pharaohs. Uh, Ignatius would have hated it because he was a very humble man. But the way to understand this grand tomb of gilded bronze and lapis lazuli is think of it as a giant opera set. And then it comes into focus and it makes sense. Uh, there is a, a painting that raises and, and lowers in front of the silver statue. Originally the statue was solid silver. Napoleon uh, melted that down, thank you very much. Um, but there is a canvas that covers that central niche uh, a good deal of the time. Uh, the, the 
bones of Ignatius lie in this gilded bronze urn underneath the altar. Uh, this is, remember, a polemical age. This is the end of uh, the, or the, the century after the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. You'll see there are two uh, great uh, pieces of sculpture here and there. I'm going to show you just details of one of them. This is Pierre Le Gros's uh, True Faith Triumphing Over the Heretics. Uh, the true, true Faith has a brand of, of uh, fire in her hand and the cross, and cascading down from her feet are two uh, people who are clearly falling down into a place you don't want to go. And next to the foot of, uh, of uh, the True Faith is this, is this splendid little image of an angel who is gleefully ripping the pages out of a book, and the spine of the book says Martin Luther with apologies to any of our Lutheran friends who are here today. So what's, the, what's the, the importance of this? The importance of this is to see how drama per permeates the whole of this experience. Uh, drama wasn't confined to the theater or stage productions. We saw already uh, these, uh, these grand facades, which s serve as a kind of a proscenium against which civic rituals are acted out, whether that's at the top of a gigantic flight of stairs in Macau on the right, or the facade of, of the Jesu in Rome where papal processions had to stop and turn the horses and basically shift gears before they could go over uh, the, uh, the Campidoglio into the Roman Forum for important ceremonies. They even devised uh, kind of extra liturgical extravaganzas, that's the only word for it, for uh, the beginning of, of Lent, for Mardi Gras. Everybody is out whooping it up on the streets, drinking and, and uh, chasing one another. Well, they said, we got to get people off the streets and back into church, so let's, let's come up with something that will bring people in to say their prayers and hear music and, and, and lead a more virtuous life. So they call up artists like Pozzo and have him design what they call a teatro sacro giant, uh, immense pieces of stage machinery that filled the apses of the churches and were used for, for uh, performance spaces and uh, for exposition of the sacrament, among other things. There was no, uh, no uh, effect that was too small. Consider these as a kind of Baroque jumbothon, and you get kind of the picture. Uh, Delectar, uh, docere, docere delectare movere, to teach, to delight, and to move. Now the place where this comes most concretely together in the, the first years of our tradition uh, were in, the, in theatrical performances. As early as 1551, Ignatius dies in 1556 just to frame the time uh, period, uh, small playlets were performed at equivalently what would have been our first high school in Messina in, uh, in Italy. Fabulae eruditiae, uh, erudite fables. Think of, of, uh, of uh, Sherman and Mr. Peabody in, uh, and you're kind of on the right track. Uh, shortly thereafter, great plays started to be performed also at... Uh, at the Collegio Romano, and these move all over the, the network. This is the, uh, uh, the, the front copy of basically the Uniform Educational Code of the Jesuits. This was first published in Rome at our college in, uh, in 1586. What, does, uh, what do they say? They say that our students and their parents become wonderfully enthusiastic and at the same time very attached to us when we train the boys Sorry uh, to the women in the audience, no co-ed yet. Uh, that took a long time to get there, long overdue. But they become very attached when we train our boys to show the result of their study, their acting ability, and their ready memory on the stage. Uh, these plays were supposed to be performed rarissime, very rarely, and... Uh, uh, Latin was to be used in all of the performances. No women should be allowed among the spectators, except that's a boy riding in the, in the chariot dressed as one of the goddesses. Uh, 
No female dress is to be used on the stage, or if it cannot be avoided, let it be decorous and dignified. And all these rules were broken before the ink had dried on the page. Performance based in the colleges gave uh, our schools a place to put forth these principles of morality and civic duty and church teachings in a very marketable way. Remember, we're before, uh, we're before TikTok, we're before uh, YouTube. Uh, this is the only show in town, and indeed in most of Catholic Europe, the only theater that was allowed to, uh, to be in, in full function was the Jesuit theater. And it gave students the experience of becoming uh, public members of society. It gave them the opportunity to be prepared for a civic and cultural life and inspired some very notable, notable alumni like Moliere and the Corneille in, in, in uh, France, like Cervantes and, and uh, Voltaire, Calderon de Barca in, in Spain, to take up writing for the stage during the, the end of the uh, 17th and the early 18th century, and has continued to inspire uh, our students even to this present day. Actors, very famous actors like Fidel Castro and Denzel Washington, Fordham alum, uh, went on for careers in performance. And I think we can, we can admit that Fidel Castro was a very good actor. Uh, this served an important socializing function as well. Even middle class people needed to know how to speak in public, to be trained, to be confident members, and to engage in, in, uh, in social events, even how to dance. So what do you do? The kids need to learn how to dance. You hire a dancing master. And if you possibly can, you hire uh, the dancing master of the King of France for the college in Paris, for example. And uh, anyone who knows uh, about uh, the history of ballet will tell you that, that French Jesuits are, were important figures in the development of modern ballet notation and even, uh, even practice. So this rhetorical tradition of the Ratio Studiorum a, re a retrieval of the Greco-Roman tradition of golden eloquence that was encapsulated in that, that triad to teach, to delight, and to move, that gets put in with another spin, a pedagogy that, that the Jesuits learned themselves in Paris when they studied there, and then which spread across uh, the network of schools, one that uh, has some similarities with, with modern day uh, pedagogy as well. Lots of small group work, lots of people interacting with each other, criticizing each other's work, uh, contributing to it, lots of uh, what we would call breakouts now, repetitions. They would break up kids according to, to their ability and compete for prizes and to do public presentations. Now, these early competitions played themselves out in endless ceremonies debates and disquisitions, the best and the brightest kids and the faculty members making speeches, long and tedious speeches in Greek and Latin, uh, who recited ancient or modern poems for the amusement of the bigwigs, the cardinals and the dukes and the, the literati who, who sat around, and also for the amusement of the parents who were just happy to see little Ludwig or little Luigi on the stage talking to cardinals and dukes. It's rather like watching your kid on Jeopardy, I think. There you were in the courtyard of the college or in the college theater, and there was a prince or a cardinal nodding uh, from their big comfy chair in the middle of the room. Well, that wasn't all that happened. Gigantic spectacles, and that's the only, spettacolo is the word in, in Italian, and it fits it really well. These giant spectacles uh, were performed two or three times a year at the different colleges. Here, the Collège Louis, de, Louis Le Grand, the, the College of Louis the Great, college founded by Louis XIV in Paris. Uh, the courtyard is turned into a giant theater, and VIPs get to sit up in the windows. There's, there's one story told of the sister of a duke who was tickled by the fact that she could throw powder puffs out and hit the, the aging fathers on the tops of their heads and 
clouds of, of powder would, uh, would uh, rise from their wigs. Twice a year during the academic calendar, especially in August and at carnival time, so uh, the beginning of Lent, for world celebrations, for canonizations, for coronations, for victories, for the birthday of the king, uh, whatever, the name day of the, of the town of the college, twice a year in 500 colleges for more than 150 years. Do the math. That's 100,000, maybe 150,000 performances. Oftentimes, as I said, the theater was the only theater in town where you could go for free entertainment. So, what did it feel like? The uh, Claude Menestrier uh, describes how the play is worked out. It's always the same thing. Three parts of the world, three mountains, three lions, three lynxes, three soldiers, four rivers, four forests, discord everywhere, and religion for no particular reason, suddenly descending on a cloud to settle everything. <laughs> what these plays were, uh, it's, it's hardly high, high theater. Mostly journeyman productions written in doggerel verse by overworked young Jesuits. Uh, vernacular printed programs were provided uh, that told the parents what little Benoit or little Bernardo was declaiming on the stage in Latin or in Greek in a performance that lasted sometimes up to four hours, where before TV and long movies, no, uh, no, no opportunity to get to uh, Amazon Prime here. Storylines came from the history of the church, they came from the Byzantine Empire, they came from the stories of the saints, with a carefully infused measure of heroic and slightly sanitized pagan antiquity. They couldn't do full-blown tragedy in this context. Uh, it just didn't make sense, because ancient plays had morals that didn't fit the program and the endings were wrong. Christian history ultimately has a happy ending. The resurrection of Christ confirms that. What, what serves to explicate and advance something uh, uh, is what they, they this, this sort of program is what they, they focused on. How do we get to the kingdom of God? Uh, so the most common themes were tragic comedies. Uh, like, like many of Mozart's operas, stories that contain heavy, uh, life-changing elements, but ultimately end up happily. As early as 1570, uh, a dance of demons accompanied a, a Jesuit uh, college play in Lisbon, Dance and Spectacle, incorporated the rediscovered world of, of pagan antiquity, the treasure chest of metaphors and mythology in a safe way. It delighted the eye, after listening to teenage kids to claim in Latin while walking around like statues. There were all kinds of intervals, uh, intermezzi, uh, little, little breakouts where you can do things that you can't do in poems. You can illustrate, you can illustrate, oops, let me go back here. You can illustrate, that's a great effect, isn't it? Uh, you can illustrate the vices here, envy, who is a pretty horrible looking old person with a heart that's choked by snakes. Um, you, can, uh, you can show uh, avarice uh, with uh, a person dragging around ch uh, chains of, of money, uh, chains of money bags like Jacob Marley. Gossiping calumny is chirped with chirping crickets in her hair. Shenography. We have, we have very few of these, because this is all ephemeral stuff. Very few of these have survived, but this one volume that, that was found in a, in a private library in Hungary gives us a sense of, of just how elaborate all this stuff was. Uh, they were lightened up. They lightened up what would otherwise have been tedious displays and allowed them safely to go back into this ancient world while where fortuna and virtue uh, can teeter-totter on the stage. They became road shows. The scripts and the costumes and the, the, the scenery moved from town to town. And there's evidence that some of the plays performed in the New World came over in the saddlebags of the missionaries who left, uh, who left Europe. 
whenever uh, possible, especially at, at Paris and at Louis Le Grand, uh, they, they hired the best talent they could. They hired the best composers like uh, Marc-Antoine Charpentier or uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully to, to write music for their scores. Um, and uh, they would hire the opera singers to come in to perform at Vespers on Sunday afternoon because that was a way of bringing people in. A little parenthesis I have to share with you because it's just too, too good not to. Uh, in the bottom uh, right here, you see uh, the, the preacher royal, uh, the official uh, preacher to, uh, to the king of France. Nice image of you, Father Paul. Nice to have you here. Uh, this is Father Bordelou, Father Charles Bordelou, famous preacher who uh, was so famous that people came at two o'clock for a two o'clock service at ten o'clock in the morning, and they had their servants sit in the chairs for them. The ladies were served hot chocolate while they waited, and because his his homilies were not only very moving but very very long, they commissioned from China and then later from Europe little porcelain pea pots to go underneath the pews so that the ladies wouldn't have to get up and go out uh, during Father Bordelou's long, uh, long and tedious homilies. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This one is in the collection at, uh, at the Legion of Honor here in San Francisco, and they are called, appropriately, Bordelous after, uh, after the father. Uh, another Jesuit contribution to Western culture. <laughs> So what did they see and experience? Let me just read you quickly uh, one play. This, this is the, the stage directions for a popular play that was, was written in 1622 to celebrate the canonization of St. Ignatius. It's called St. Ignatius or the Change in Arms. Act the first wherein a boy speaks as he drops from a cloud to the stage. Uh, the boy, or the continents arrive. We've seen them before. And there follows immediately in a, a uh, festive dance after the Indian fashion. Act the second, St. Ignatius enters the Church of the Virgin. The scene, change, change, the scene changes to a theater. Then the evil genius of Luther is born through the air on a chariot. A chasm opens. The vices come forth one by one as, as called. St. Ignatius prays before the altar. The church militant with St. Michael the Archangel, the good genie of Europe, Asia, Africa, and America appear in the heavens. The church is opened. St. Ignatius is seen before the, images, uh, the image of the Virgin hanging up his arms. Thunder and lightning uh, can, uh, pursue. Uh, there's a battle of Moors and Spaniards. A cloud appears, and from the cloud, thunder and lightning. While Ignatius prays, centaurs arrive uh, and... Uh, Try, on, uh, try to, to distract him during his prayers. At the name of Jesus, the centaurs disappear, the heavens open, disclosing angels who are forging arms for the saints. We'll go back here for a second. Uh, then, pirate ships appear. Pirate ships? Why not? And a passenger vessel, pirates attack a, a, a boat full, filled with Jesuits who are on their way to Brazil. The Jesuit, one of the Jesuits produces an image of the Virgin Mary, uh, which he, the pirates cannot wrest from his grant, uh, grasp. They throw him overboard and he drowns. But Neptune uh, grabs the image of the Virgin Mary, rises from the depths, accompanied by the chorus of playful waves, uh, some dancing, some riding on the backs of dolphins. Imagine, these are high school kids on paper mache dolphins uh, dancing around. The waves dance and crown an image of the Virgin with coral. And a final scene appears in which St. Francis Xavier's prayers and a vision of Ignatius puts the Turks to flight. Where did the Turks come from? We don't know. Heaven opens, disclosing Christ in the background. A ray of light falls from the Queen of Heaven. The vices disappear into a chasm. Into a chasm. Uh, Michael the Archangel and the good genie of Europe uh, are born up to heaven, and each of them appears uh, uh, on their own chariot and fly on home. The end in only four hours. This is industrial light and magic on Barry Bond steroids. And it's all done without a green screen and with no CGI. This is paper mache and wire and kids flying around on ropes. Uh, 
trapdoors opening, belching fire, uh, specialty fireworks that the Jesuits imported at great expense from their missions in China, uh, and one of the favorite uh, pieces. Oh, here we are. I didn't get you through all these. Here's a few of these, uh, these pieces. Uh, dogs. Every kid wanted to have his dog pull the chariots. A triumphant ch chariot, a chariot is described which, in which will ride a victorious eagle and a lion. Six horses that will draw the chariot. Little, Twelve little eagles will dance around to music for the triumph of this. Uh, the uh, crown for the eagle that it can take off. Five or six idols that can be thrown down quickly. And, of course, the throne and the dog-pulled chariot. Uh, and the, there was huge uh, competition among the boys. Uh, and then a lion that can be managed by two little boys inside, as well as a beast that can be torn apart by eagles. Just ordinary stuff. In the spire in Germany, the Calvinists were moved to tears, they said. And one performance was judged superior in effect to all the preaching and psalm singing of Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists put together. Now, we're used to having art classes. There were no formal studio art classes, but in order to get all this stuff done, you had to have knowledge of, of art, of design, of geometry, of building, uh, basic building construction, painting, sculpture, and all of those were taught in a practical way to the students. Here's a dance performance at, uh, at Versailles, just a little afternoon event. And above uh, Father Minestrier, whom we saw before, who was the, uh, the, uh, the master of the, of, the, uh, of the dancers. There's not time to go into the importance of, of this in dance, nor is there time to look seriously at, at, at the musical contributions. Uh, music has always been a part of the tradition. Uh, Francis Xavier in India uh, didn't speak the language very well at all, but he learned little songs that he could teach to the kids. Uh, down below, uh, uh, Joseph Amio, uh, a Jesuit from, uh, from France, became one of the first ethnomusicologists that we have record of, and he sent back uh, Chinese folk tunes to, uh, to, to Europe. Uh, the organist from the Church of the Jesu in Rome joins the order and goes off to the world, uh, Domenico Zippoli, and some of his music uh, appears actually in the, in the film, The Mission. Now, I'm going to stop uh, because in uh, the late 1700s, the whole enterprise basically sank. Uh, the, the Pope put the Jesuits out of business for a, vari a variety of reasons that are too complicated to get to uh, in, a, in the, the amount of time we have. This huge international network of, of schools, of colleges, of churches fell out of, uh, of our hands and much, much of it, was, uh, it became the origin of state libraries and state schools. The churches remained. The order was, was brought back to life in, uh, the, in the early years of the 19th century. Uh, the reason that we are here in San Francisco is that Italian Jesuits from, from northern Italy and from Rome were kicked out of Italy again, and they came here to the Wild West. Uh, Father uh, Michael Accolti uh, came down from Oregon uh, and said, uh, we're not looking for gold in this place, but to do a little good. Uh, and he said, I don't know whether I've, I've arrived in Babylon or a bordello, so, uh, so riotous is the immorality here. It was a perfect place for them to be. The college was founded here in 15, 1855. Feels like 1555 sometimes. 1855, and we've been in business ever since. I'm happy to just to, to, to add one final coda on here, and that's to say uh, I'm so happy that we were able, after a long period of, of uh, almost willful ignorance of the arts, to bring the arts back to uh, our kind of education, not just here in San Francisco, but across our network of colleges and universities 
across the United States and indeed in our high schools and even in our, in our elementary schools. It's such an important part of who we are to, to teach, to, to delight, and to move people. Uh, and that's why we began uh, those schools in, in, uh, with all of the different, uh, different modalities of teaching rhetoric, of teaching a literature, of teaching history, and certainly teaching and using the arts. I'm so happy that this place has embraced that again, glad for the support of the administration and the, the splendid faculty uh, that we've managed to put together here. Uh, glad for my colleagues, uh, especially grateful to Glory for the wonderful work she continues to do in the Thatcher Gallery, and for the university for trusting us with some really beautiful real estate in the middle of the library where we've been able to, uh, to bring questions and solutions and challenges and things that are beautiful and good and true in front of our students. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna hang out over at the reception. Very good to be with you today. Very good to be back in this place that I love so much. Thank you.